Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brittany DeFilly. I'm the Educational and Outreach Coordinator here at Vertex. We have a couple of special guests joining us today from Ruckus. We have John Murphy and Terry Henry. They're going to be doing some demonstrations of Cloud Path enrollment. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to John. John, it is all yours. Thank you. Yeah, John Murphy here. I'm a principal systems engineer with Ruckus, and I've been with the company a little over 10 years, and I have worked a lot with Cloud Path and helped a lot of uh, educational institutions in particular, where there's a lot of interest in device onboarding, um, use Cloud Path to get devices onboarded to the network uh, and, and just kind of make things easier for the admins at the same time. So let's just kick it right off. I have a few slides here just to kind of set the stage for what we're talking about, and then we'll jump into the actual uh, user interface and take a look at some things. So first of all, I mean, in a kind of very general high level terms, what is Cloud Path? Well, Cloud Path uh, is an enrollment system that delivers secure network access for any user, any device on any network. Uh, any user means um, any of your users in the sense of uh, students, faculty, admin, what, whatever kind of users you may have. And also those users, uh, the, identi the identity information for those users could be hosted in a range of different identity providers. So we can talk to Active Directory, we can talk to any SAML provider like Google Groups or Azure AD. Um, we can also talk to backend uh, generic LDAP and radius servers. So that's really any user. Any device means that regardless of the device, you're going to be able to get it onboarded with Cloud Path, whether this is like a, a Windows laptop, a, a Mac a MacBook or a Mac device, any of the mobile operating systems. Um, that could be Android, it could be iPhones, it could even be Windows phones, and we even support Blackberries if you somehow manage to still have one of those. Um, and then any network means any network um, in the sense of it could be a wireless network, could be a wired network. Also, it could be a network that's not a ruckus network. Uh, so Cloud Path does have third party support for other wireless vendors. Uh, we, of course, would prefer that you put in a ruckus network. And there's a, a couple things that we do that are unique for ruckus wireless. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Um, but this will work across any uh, any vendor's equipment that you might have if you need to solve that onboarding problem. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of how you get Cloud Path and put it in, it comes in sort of two flavors. So you can either get this as a cloud service that we manage um, and just kind of set it up for you and you just need to uh, purchase those subscriptions for the users. Or you can put this on premises, which could either be, um, it could be on premises in the sense of a virtual machine that you run locally on the site, or it could be a virtual machine that you prefer to host in your own uh, public cloud if you have a, a, all of your stuff is in AWS or Azure or something like that. Um, these days, most people prefer to go the cloud hosted model to be kind of let us do more of the work for you, but it's up to you. And then as far as what the software does, basically it includes these three components you see at the left. So there's a security and certificate management piece. So Cloud Path is a full public key infrastructure. Uh, it is a certificate authority. It can issue certificates. Um, we'll talk about why we want certificates in a minute here. Uh, it can also do policy management. So in terms of uh, classifying your users into different policies, uh, it's likely you already have done some of that using security groups and we can just map to the same groups, uh, but there's lots of flexibility there. Uh, and then the device enablement and onboarding is, is the, you know, getting the devices on. So this comes in a couple of flavors and we'll, we'll talk about it. Now, let's get straight to the point. Like, what can Cloud Path do for you? So this comes in kind of two big buckets. And the first one is devices that you can manage via NDMs. So, so these days when I talk to customers, most people want to get m most of their devices managed by some kind of NDM. And this is going to be depending on what the device is. But uh, in education, it breaks down into typically, uh, you know, for K through 12, I see lots of Chromebooks, uh, and Chromebooks are managed in most cases by the the Google uh, Chromebook Management Console, which I think they like to change the name of every six months. Um, but you know, basically, no one's using unmanaged Chromebooks at scale because that would be extremely painful. Or at least I hope you're not. So if you have managed Chromebooks, then we can integrate. Uh, I'm going to give you an example for Chromebooks here, but this applies to pretty much all the MDMs uh, that we support. And we support Chromebooks via a special Google integration that we do. And we support the others uh, via the SCEP protocol, Simple Certificate Enrollment Protocol. And pretty much all your MDMs are going to support that. So this works with uh, Microsoft Intune. This works with Jamf. This works with Mosul. Um, you know, as long as it supports SCEP, this is going to work. Uh, and it's going to be pretty much the same once you have this set up and configured. And here's what the user experience looks like. Uh, you know, you're going to get that device into your MDM, you know, whether your admin does that or the user does that themselves. 
Uh, and that's it, right? Once it's in the MDM, the MDM is going to talk to CloudPath. CloudPath is going to give it the device access. Uh, we're we're going to prefer to use certificate-based device access. So that's 802.1x with EPTLS. That's the most secure way. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and it's going to just automatically install that in the device. And then you're done, essentially, at that point. And then from day two on, as long as that certificate's good, that device just seamlessly connects. And then what does that look like specifically uh, in terms of the Google Chromebooks? And again, this is pretty similar with Intune or other MDMs. Basically, you're going to go and sign into that MDM. Uh, you're going to sign into the CloudPath uh, admin, uh, you know, the CloudPath uh, admin uh, interface, and you're going to configure an integration between those two. It's basically just an API key that needs to be exchanged. Uh, and it's pretty simple to get that set up. We do have, of course, documentation for all this. And we also have some pre-scoped professional services um, you know, where we have a team of guys to just do this all the time and they can make it go really quick and easy for you. And basically, once you get it, once you get this done, then the devices are just going to sort of magically connect to the Wi-Fi. Here's what you'll see in a Chromebook specifically. Uh, once the user logs in, you're going to see this uh, cloud path certificate generator pop up. This is an extension for the Chrome OS uh, that we use to get the certificates on the Chromebooks. Um, and then for the other MDMs like uh, Intune, et cetera, this is just going to be Intune pushing the settings down to the machine. But basically, it'll create that uh, certificate, it'll import it into the device, and then the device is going to connect to that more secure operating system. Once you have the certificate on your device, it's just a matter of like uh, tapping on the network name, uh, you know, for, for most devices. But for, for Chrome devices uh, and certain other devices, they're, they're always going to prefer a more secure network if they have it. So you'll see it automatically switch over to the secure network. That's the experience for your MDM devices. Um, it's going to make it a lot easier to get those on the Wi-Fi in a really secure way. And then for everything else, you're going to have a self-service onboarding. Um, there's a couple of exceptions for, for headless devices. We can talk about it later. But for all of your like BYOD and guest devices, it's going to look like this. On day one, when that device hits your network, that, um, that user is going to join uh, usually a captive portal. Um, it doesn't have to be a captive portal. It could be a portal that's accessible over the internet. And we, we see for our higher ed customers, uh, that can be really popular. We call that pre-boarding. And if you think about um, the higher ed institution, one of the big problems you have in IT is that like everyone moves in the same weekend and that creates a flood of help desk tickets and it's just like brutal. So if you can spread out that onboarding over a couple of weeks, um, that's gonna really help you out if you do have any issues. And end users always create issues. Um, it just depends on how many of them you see. But this can really help you out where you send out that welcome email to the students as they're getting ready to come down to the campus. And in there, you can include a link to CloudPath that lets them access CloudPath over the internet, get their devices all set up. And then when they get onto campus, their devices are already provisioned for access. So they'll just connect to the network. Uh, it really makes life easier. But basically you walk through a captive portal. Um, you could have some decisions that you make. It works kind of like a flow chart. It's very customizable in what you can do in that. And we call that a workflow inside of CloudPath. Um, but basically you walk through there. Typically you, you do some kind of authentication either to like say a SAML or an Active Directory, you log in. Um, maybe we classify you based off of your security group and apply some policy, and then we either get that certificate pushed to your device or have some other means of getting you on the network, and we can talk about the options there. But then once that's set up, then for as long as that authorization is good for, that device is just going to connect. So it's going to make those BYOD devices a lot easier, too. Uh, and then kind of one last thing I want to walk through, and this will be a probably review for most of you, but I just want to really quickly just touch on kind of these different types of wireless network security experiences and why we're, um, you know, why we're working to get to EPTLS with certificates for, for most devices. So in general, it breaks down in these three buckets. You have your open networks, which are unencrypted and there's really no verification that happens. Um, and then you have your, your WPA2 or WPA3 uh, pre-shared keys. And then you have your WPA2 or 3 enterprise, which is your 802.1X. And we'll just real quickly uh, run through these three. So open, um, an open network is unencrypted. Really the only good thing about an open network is it's super easy to connect to, right? So the, the end user experience here, you can't beat it. You, anyone can connect, don't need to know a password, don't need to know anything, you're just on. But once you get on, your, your traffic's not encrypted and we didn't really validate your device and, and you didn't really validate the network. So not much security there. I think everyone knows this. The next thing you see is a, a pre-shared key. Uh, pre-shared key, you know, it stands for, um, pre-shared key, PSK, but sometimes we call it publicly shared key because what happens is people write these down or they share them with their friends um, and, it, and it gets out. 
Uh, one thing you'll see sometimes in educational environments, uh, well, in many environments, sometimes people like to just create multiple networks or SSIDs uh, for different purposes, right? So you might see a student SSID and a faculty SSID. And if you use pre-shared keys there, uh, approximately eight seconds after the SSID starts broadcasting, you have students trying to figure out what the faculty key is. And all it takes is one person to write that down and it gets out. And now you have to change the key, which means you have to go change it on every device that's using it. And it's kind of a pain. Um, so it is better in the sense that it's encrypted, but lots of problems here with PSK as well. And then you get into what we really want to do, which is the enterprise modes. So this is your 802.1x. Now here, there is a kind of a, a mutual authentication that can happen. So there's a radius server involved. Um, so the radius server presents a certificate that you have to accept. You know, some of you that have tried to implement radius, you may have seen these certificate warnings that you can sometimes see. And uh, Cloud Path is going to get around that because it's going to push that trust to the device for you. But basically, there's a certificate that the radius server presents. And there's also some trust of the user. The user is either going to provide a username and password, or they're going to provide a device certificate. And so the, both the client and the network are authenticated, and you have your over-the-air encryption. So this is really uh, what you want to do. And in addition, when you do .1x, the radius server can return attributes back to the wireless controller or the switch. So you can do dynamic things like put people on different VLANs or apply ACLs or apply rate limits, or you can treat people differently um, based off of what kind of security group they're in, for example. And in the case of certificates, here's kind of what that looks like. So here's just a quick walkthrough of what a certificate-based authentication looks like. So you have your device and it's gonna to associate to the access point and the, uh, the radius server, in this case, CloudPath, will present a certificate that it's, it's um, proving that it is who it says it is, right? And the device has to validate that. So now you know that you are, you are connecting to the correct network that you intended to because you've validated that certificate that the device has. And then the client will present its own certificate. So this is a certificate that's unique to that device. So you can identify specifically what that device is. And because CloudPath knows which user onboarded that device, you know who that user is. So now you've done a mutual authentication both ways, both the network and the user have been authenticated and the device. And then you can return, uh, you either accept or deny, right? So if, if we issued that certificate and it's still within the validity period that we gave out, then we're gonna return and accept. And we can optionally return additional attributes like a VLAN or a user role. So here you can see we're returning VLAN 10 and the user role of student. So this means that I could have um, one SSID that serves many different purposes. And based off of who I am when I connect to it, I get a different experience. Uh, and reducing the number of your SSIDs is, is very good practice just from uh, a best, best practices Wi-Fi RF design perspective. Uh, just because of the nature of how the uh, SSID beaconing works and the management frames are going out at the lowest data rate, which means they're using more airtime. And airtime is just kind of the physical layer one of Wi-Fi. You only have so much and you, you really can't get more. And the FCC in the US mandates that. So you have a certain amount of spectrum you can use, you have a certain you know, channel width that you're using um, and you, know, you get that much airtime. So the more of it you use on these beacons for your SSIDs, the less you have for your your data. Uh, so it's always good to reduce your SSIDs if you can. Uh, and then at the end of that, you are now connected, right? So you're connected, which means now you can do your DHCP and you're on, you're on the network. Now, there is this other thing called Ruckus DPSK. So I mentioned Ruckus has some special sauce where if you're using a Ruckus wireless network, then CloudPath can, can give you some additional things um, that will make your life easier. And the, the biggest one of those is this Ruckus DPSK. So DPSK is dynamic pre-share key. We talked about pre-share key when it is. Um, so, and we talked about dot one X and, and radius uh, backend networks and how they work. And in my mind, this is the, the perfect balance between the two. So the end user or client experience for a dynamic pre-share key is the same as a regular pre-share key. And that means that your device doesn't have to support certificates or radio servers or, or dot one X. And as long as it supports a WPA2 pre-shared key, which every Wi-Fi device does, then, then you can use it. And all you need to do to get on this network is just type in your password, just like any pre-shared key uh, SSID that, you know, that you might use at home, for example, you just put the password in and you're on. So that from a client perspective, it works just like a regular pre-shared key. In fact, the, the user may not even know it's not that. But what's different is we can now give you as many of those as you want. 
Uh, so each device can have its own key or each user can have their own key. And we can use dynamic policies and return those attributes just like we did with the 802.1x. So I can still return a dynamic VLAN and a dynamic policy to that user, uh, but all they have to do is just put that key in. And then there's interesting ways we can distribute those keys. So I can either uh, get a key you know, right in my web browser as I onboard through the portal, or I could provision these keys, uh, you know, sometimes for like dorms, what we like to do is uh, pre-provision dorm uh, units inside a cloud path, and then we can just email or uh, SMS message those keys out to all the users, and then they've got them. So it's a really nice balance of, uh, of both methods. And then kind of the last thing before we get to the, the demo um, is this idea of uh, Mac authentication. So this is another way that you can get devices on the network. Uh, and that can be used to secure Wi-Fi, right? Um, well, sort of. So we do see Mac authentication, and you, you still can use it. But what we've seen is that the device manufacturers, so specifically the mobile device manufacturers, are now starting to use randomized MAC addresses. So this, instead of using the, the MAC address that's kind of baked into the hardware that every device has, they create their own randomized MAC address. And um, you know, devices started doing this a while back, but the, the, the big change that's happened more recently in the Apple devices with iOS 18 is that they now will rotate these MAC addresses. So not only are they gonna use the random MAC address, but they will change it over time. And what we've seen so far is that they probably won't change that for a couple of weeks. However, we know that Apple is, is very concerned about user privacy uh, and MAC address randomization and rotation is uh, coming from the privacy space. So we expect them to kind of go more strict on this in the future and really encourage you to get away from MAC authentication for wireless uh, for authentication. It still has a place for wired authentication because we don't really see the wired devices changing their MAC addresses, but uh, but there are other there are better methods there as well. I mean, you're better off using a certificate. If you have to, you can use MAC authentication on, on the wired side. And on the wireless side, you can use it if you're just doing a short-term guest authentication, that can still work. Um, but there's reasons that you might wanna switch to something like DPSK, we'll, and we'll talk about it. Okay, and then lastly, um, here is just a, a, I wanna introduce you to this concept of policy management. So as you have users onboarding devices, you have some combination of user and device. And with CloudPath, you can have a unique policy for each of those combinations. So what I mean is like, I might wanna treat, um, not only treat like a student and a faculty different, but I might wanna treat a faculty BYOD device different than a faculty device that I gave that faculty member. And you can do that with CloudPath. Okay, so let's get into a little bit of the demo of what the UI looks like. So this is CloudPath and within CloudPath, there's a few things you can do. So firstly, I'll talk about the uh, kind of the self-service methods. Um, let me go into my workflow series. You can see I have a number of these workflows. You can have as many as you'd like, but really most customers are only gonna need one. So you can do a lot within a single workflow. So this is a workflow within CloudPath. You can see I have a series of steps here and you follow this from, from top down. You start at step one and you, and you go down. Um, and like step one is require the users to accept the terms and conditions. Step two, you can see there's there's like a couple different options here. And, and depending on which option I have, I go down a different path. Um, and I can insert, the way I build these, I can insert a step at any point. And there's like a whole bunch of different things that CloudPath can do. And you basically build out this workflow. So the easiest way to understand this is to, is to look at the end user view first. Let me pull up what an end user will see. So if I'm connecting to this network, uh, and by the way, this is a, a kind of a generic lab example um, for education. And, you know, this maps to the most kind of common aggregate use case that I see, but this is all very customizable. So if anyone has a, a question about a specific use case they have or anything like that, um, if anyone is uh, on to ask that question, then feel free to ask. So I'm gonna click start. You know, I, I had the terms and conditions. I could have looked at those if I wanted to. I'll click start. And I break this down into two basic uh, categories here. So login or, or register. So if I have uh, an, an identity that I can log in with, then I can click the top one. And if I don't, that means I'm, I'm some kind of visitor and I'll click the bottom one. So I'll walk you through the top use case first. So let's say I'm a student and I'll click in here and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be asked to authenticate. In this case, I have an Active Directory, local Active Directory, um, but this also works with, with SAML. Um, more commonly now I see SAML via Google Groups or Azure AD. Uh, it, it essentially works the same. With, with SAML, you do get redirected to the IDP's uh, uh, page, you know, to, to see the credential input. So it looks a tiny bit different, but on the back end, it all works the same. So I'm going to log in as a student. 
And you'll see now I have two options. I can set this device up to access the classroom network, or I can connect my personal device. So if I want to access the classroom network, this is going to be my certificate based EPTLS 802.1x. So you can see I'm, I'm being prompted to install this profile. Uh, I'm on a Mac here. Um, so this is a mobile config profile, standard Apple profile for onboarding devices. Uh, and if I, if I click this, it'll install the profile and then I'll be able to connect to the network. So it's pretty much that simple. Uh, click the profile, install, approve the profile in your settings, and then you're, and then you're on with the most secure type of wireless uh, authentication. Now we do support lots of OSs. If this were a Windows device, then I would have an executable that I could download or, or a zip, right? Sometimes you can't download executables, so we give you both options. Uh, and then that would be essentially the same. You'd, you'd run that and it would get your Windows device uh, connected to the network securely. Uh, for Apple uh, iPhones, iPads, um, that's going to work just like a Mac. So that's going to be a mobile config profile. That's, that's standardized across all the Apple devices. For the Android devices, there's going to be an app in the Play Store that you'll install on your Android device, and then you'll you'll click a link to install the network through the app. And then we also support you know less common devices like Linux and Windows Phone, etc. So that's the basic kind of BYOD onboarding process, uh, or, or you know self service certificate onboarding process. If I come through here and I say, um, let me log in again here. So let's say I want to connect my personal device. Well, in, in this case, I'm using a Ruckus Dynamic Pre-Sure key. So how this works is you can see it's it's telling me here is your personal Wi-Fi password for the BYOD network, and here it is. So in this case, I need to connect to this network called BYOD, which is being broadcast, and this is the password that I put in. Now for my lab, I have this set to the most simple format. So it's just eight digits numeric, and that's the kind of the least secure key that you can create, but you have flexibility to create this any way you want. This can be uh, a large number of characters. It can be you know, alphanumeric, it can include ASCII characters. So it's up to you how complex you wanna make this key. Uh, but essentially to get any device on the network now, it, not necessarily the device I'm on by the way, but any device, this is now my key. So. I can issue limits on these keys and we can look at that. You know, I, it can be for one device or multiple devices, but if I haven't set a device limit, I can essentially use this on, on what I'd like. And now if I'm on a mobile device, some of the mobile device uh, OSs now support long pressing of a QR code to join the network. So this QR code you see has the SSID and the key embedded into it. So if I scan this QR code, with um, any kind of like smartphone or tablet, it's going to try and join that network immediately. So it's got everything that the device needs to join the network, including the key, is built into that QR code. If I wanna get the device I'm on onboarded and it's a mobile device, I can just long press that QR code and get on. And I also have the option here of this copy button. So if, if I just want to copy the password, I can click copy, it'll copy that password to my clipboard and now I can go to my settings, you know, tap on this BYD network and then paste that key in. So there's multiple ways of getting that key on your device. So that's more of a BYOD um, dynamic pre-share key type of onboarding. So the first one you saw with the certificate profile, it really is the most secure way. And that one does work across uh, all different um, Wi-Fi controller vendors, as long as they support .1x, which, which you know, all of the good ones are going to. And um, th this one is specific for Ruckus. So the DPSK is a Ruckus only thing. Now, if I, if I go back and, and run through uh, this again, and just to show you kind of some of the differences, if I click on the same login button where I log in as a student, uh, let's say now I log in this my admin account. So I'm clicked on the exact same thing. I'm just logging in with a different username. And in this case, this, this admin account, it maps to an admin security group that I have. And I have CloudPath set up to treat my admins differently. I also have CloudPath set up to treat my faculty differently, but it, it kind of looks very similar. In the case of student versus faculty, I'm just issuing a certificate from a different from a different certificate template, and I'll show you what those look like in a minute. Uh, in this case, I'm giving the admin additional options. So I still have this onboard my device option, which is which is the profile that you saw for getting a certificate on the device. Um, I have this create a DPSK option, which is essentially the same as you just saw for my DPSK uh, BYOD experience that the student had, and then I have this register a MAC address thing. So this register MAC address is something built for the admin. And, and this is just something that I kind of built custom and you can do lots of custom things in CloudPath. But here, if I click register a MAC address, you can see I've built a couple of different MAC address lists. So I have cameras, phones, and smart boards. And in, in this case, I'm, I'm intending these to be used more for 
wired devices, but they could be wireless if it's short term. Uh, and most of these kind of headless devices, they don't rotate MAC addresses, so you could use uh, MAC authentication as well. Um, but these tend to be more wired devices. So let's say I have a camera. And then here for the uh, camera, it's going to ask me to enter the MAC address. So I enter the MAC address for the camera and I'm done. Success. So as an admin, I've given, a, I've given my admins a simple way. If they need to get one of those headless devices online, they can just go through the same cloud path workflow that all my end users use but once they log in with their admin credentials it gives them some additional options and you can build you know whatever kind of additional options you might want there and we can talk about any custom use cases anyone has but um, in this case i've built some mac authentication lists and it's very easy for me just to have a, an admin add something to that list now, if i wanted to i could i could also ask for additional information here if i wanted to capture like the serial number of the device or the location of the device CloudPath can, can prompt for those things and it'll store that with the enrollment record that's created. Uh, you know, for each of these devices that I onboard to this portal, I'm gonna get an enrollment record. And we'll look at those. Um, okay, so that, that gave you a couple of examples of, uh, of onboarding where you're authenticating something on the back end. Now let's look at a couple of guest examples. So now if I come back in and I click I'm a visitor, then you can see I have sponsored and unsponsored. Um, let me start with unsponsored. If I don't have a sponsor, Typically, I'm going to do this with uh, SMS authentication. Uh, you have the options of SMS and email. I could present both options to the user and let them pick, or I could pick one or the other. I, I tend to use uh, SMS for this. So what it means is that I'm collecting some, some kind of information from the user. I'm not just letting anyone on. You have to put a phone number in here. Um, and, and you have to put a real phone number in, because if you don't, you're not going to get a text message, right? So let me put my real phone number in here. And I'll go ahead and click send. And then what's happening in the background is I'm going to get a text message, which I just now got. And I have to put in a four digit code. So I put my code in and I click continue. And in this case, you can see the result is I get another one of these dynamic pre share keys. So these days, I like to use dynamic pre share keys for guests if I have a Rockus network. The reason for that is it's an encrypted network. Um, your other option is I could just do a, a MAC address authentication with a click through. And that experience would be, I would just, instead of getting this code, I would just get a message that says, success, you're connected to the network. And this is kind of you know, what you tend to see when you log into a captive portal network at a hotel or a coffee shop or something like that, right? We can do that with CloudPath too. Uh, I don't love to do that because what ends up happening is at the end of the process, you get on the network, but you're still on that open, unencrypted SSID. So you don't have any wireless level encryption. I like to add that wireless encryption level for my users. So that's why I like to use these dynamic pre-shared keys for guests as well. But it's completely up to you. You can do it any way, any way you like. So then let me go through, walk you through my, my last kind of self-service example here, which is a sponsored uh, onboarding. So in this case, I'm someone who um, needs sponsored access. Now, typically you might have a, a short term guest access that anyone can do self service. And I might have a longer term access for sponsors. And I might use this uh, for, you know, when I have contractors that come in that need access to the network. Maybe they're going to be there for a couple of days. I want to make it a little easier on them uh, and on my, uh, and on my um, users that they don't have to keep approving uh, these requests all the time. So this is flexible with how you want to prompt things, but typically it's like a name and a company a reason. I'll put in ruckus here, and then we'll see what the reason is that I need internet. So what happens now is there's a request that, that gets kicked off in the back end. So I'm going to get, or the sponsor, in this case it's me, is going to get an email. And here's what that looks like. So I just got this email. Wi-Fi access has been requested by John Murphy, and this is the company, and they need internet. So I'm going to go ahead and click review here, and that opened in a different browser. So here's what that looks like. And now this is what the sponsor sees. So, and again, this is all customizable for what you want the, uh, you know, both the user and the sponsor to see here. But in this case, how it's set up is the default number of days of access is 30. And I'm giving my sponsor the ability to adjust that anywhere from one all the way up to 90. So now it's up to the sponsor um, to adjust how long this user has access to the internet. So maybe I'm having some work done and I know this person's really probably gonna need three weeks of access so I can set this to 21 days. And then I have two different reasons that I can put in here. I can have the reason for the user 
uh, you know, welcome to the network. Um, this is just the message that gets displayed to the user. And the reason for the admins, you know, I am approving 21 days. Oh, can't type. 21 days access, uh, you know, for this HVAC contract or whatever it might be. So you can record essentially the reason that that got approved and that gets tied to the enrollment record and uh, goes into CloudPath. And so I'll approve that. And what will happen here is this will update and the user will, um, in this case, DPSK. You can see I do love these DPSKs. They're super flexible and easy for the users to use. Um, quick story, I had a, a customer that was using uh, certificates for BYOD and they ended up um, having some issues with, you know, some of their some of their user experience. You know, when you're dealing with end users, sometimes you get a very wide range of capabilities and um, even just a little bit extra than putting a password in was too much for, for some of the folks at this one particular customer. And they ended up switching to this BYOD using DPSK and like they loved it. It was just everyone knows how to do this, right? You connect your network, you put a password in. So that's my quick story. So that's pretty much it, right? That's that's your overview of the self-service onboarding. And let's look a little bit now at the some of the backend stuff. So let's look at what we can see here in CloudPath. So firstly, I have um, I do have a device connected that I onboard to CloudPath. Let me see if that's going to show up here. Yeah. So I do have my my phone here. So one thing I can do is I can look at connections. This is going to show me any of the devices that onboarded through CloudPath um, that are connected currently. So you can see I do have this this one device connected. Uh, you can see it's connected. You can see the IP address. I can see the MAC address. I can see the username. So this is that J student user that I was using in the demo there. And you can see what SSID is connected to. And in this case, this one's been on for, for 44 minutes. So if I click into the hourglass here to inspect this a little bit, I can see some more information. So I can see um, information on like the NAS ID and NAS IP. So that's going to tell you like which access point this, this user is connected to. And you can see, um, information on their traffic. So, you know, this, this user is not doing much, 641 kilobytes of, of input traffic and 839 kilobytes of output traffic, not, not a whole lot. Um, and you can see their RSSI, so their signal strength is, is 25 here. So you do get a fair bit of information of, of each of the devices in CloudPath. And, and by the way, if I went over to my wireless controller, which in this case is Ruckus One, could, could be, you know, multiple different options, I'm going to see this username in my wireless controller. So now, because I've onboarded this device through CloudPath and I've done all my policy uh, assignments here and created these username identifiers, it's so like the actual username is just this first part. And the at student.ruckusdemos.net part is just a label that I've given in CloudPath and I'll show you where that is. Um, and so this is like, in this case, it's student. I might have a faculty, I might have admin, I might have, um, you know, could be whatever, whatever kind of categories you want. I might want to break out my students by grade level, uh, you know, I might want to break them out by geographic area or, you know, campus or dorm or whatever it might be, right? So you can classify these and you'll see this in your controller as well. Now you can see at the bottom here, there's this enrollment record that's also linked. So each each of these devices that you onboard gets an enrollment record when you come in through the portal and that's linked to your connection information as well. So I can drill into the enrollment record from the connection and now you can see a lot more information about this user. So you can you can immediately see this as a certificate user. And if I wanted to block this, uh, I could click the block button and block that user from enrolling. I can see information about the user. So here's the username. I can see that this is an iOS 17 iPhone, which is accurate. I can see the MAC address of the, uh, of the device. I can see all of the connection information. So this is essentially the information from that connections tab we were just looking at. All of that shows up here. I have a section for the identity information. This is coming from my IDP. In this case, it's local Active Directory. So I can see the, the common name and all of the information that came from AD. I can see the uh, policy, so the radius policy inside CloudPath that, that we matched against, which is called student certificate. And I'll show you what those policies look like here in a minute. And then you can see the group membership for this user. Um, then, you know, continuing on, you can see more detailed device information. So, you know, not only is this an iOS 17 phone, but we were using, uh, in this case, uh, the Mozilla 5.0, you know, browser, and looks like we were, um, actually, this is Safari, uh, Apple WebKit browser, and uh, Apple Apple browser, right? Form factor mobile. This is another thing that you can classify things on in CloudPath. There's lots of different filters and classification methods. 
if you want to treat mobile devices different different than tablet devices different than like say laptop type devices you can classify on those more generic categories or i can go to the os level and i could treat my ios devices differently than my android devices or and as i already mentioned you can look at things like group membership etc lots of ways of classifying users and devices uh, next you have your work workflow information i like to call this the forensic record of device onboarding so this really is uh like a capture of exactly what this user did when they onboarded so first thing you'll you'll note is there's a timestamp for the terms and conditions so like from a legal point of view you have a record that this user accepted those terms they click through here's the timestamp uh step uh, you can see each step that the user hits and what they do as they go through so you can see in this case you know the the user selected a login they successfully authenticated with this jstudent account uh, they were automatically mapped to a group called edu students based off of the group matching that we do against active directory and then they selected to onboard to the classroom network and they were issued a certificate that certificate is valid until 2025 1029 so it's one year from today that's how i have it set you can have it set any any way you like i have some higher ed institutions that will give out like a four-year certificate and follow that user through the, their four years there um, I've seen some K-12s do that as well. Um, this is kind of up to you how long you want to provide access. And then you can see that this user um, last authenticated 46 minutes ago. Moving on down, there's notifications. Um, no notifications uh, you know, have been sent for this user. Notifications can be useful when you're doing uh, self-service onboarding with certificates. That certificate is going to expire at some point, so we can send an SMS notification to the user to let them know, hey, your certificate's going to expire um, in 24 hours you're going to need to go back to this cloud path uh, portal to re-onboard your device once it expires and you can give them the link right there in the notification uh, you can see that we issued a certificate it's valid i could revoke it just by clicking this button if i decided that i didn't mean to revoke that i can it'll turn to an unrevoke button and i can unrevoke it and then i can view details here so there's lots lots and lots of information and if you need even more there's this whole enrollment variables section which most people don't need to worry about but just uh, just showing anyone that's a data nerd out there, uh, you know, it's everything in the back end that we collect about the user and everything is stored in a variable and you have access to all these variables. So as you're building these workflows, you can reference these variable names um, and anything that you want to like display to a user or you can send a notification to a user. You might also send a notification to an admin um, that includes some of this information. So that's all that's all available. Okay, so that's all your enrollments. And there's other kind of visibility things you can get here. So you have a user view, so I can look up users by the username. Wherever you see these tables, these are all text filters at the top. So if I want to only see my JStudent account, I can filter by JStudent in that way. I have a certificate view. If I want to look up any of my certificates, I can filter this in different ways. Um, we mentioned notifications. Any notification we send will show up here. There's also this event response section. This is for security incidents. So if I have something spreading on my network that's that's bad, um, some ransomware or something like that, and I just need to get people disconnected so I can mitigate it. Uh, what I can do is I can come up here to my certificates table and I can filter this to however, you know, whichever group of certificates that I want, and then go down to the bottom and export it as a spreadsheet. Then I come over to my event response and I, I click the revoke button, I attach that spreadsheet, it revokes all those certs. Then I go, you know, apply my patch or, you know, whatever it is I needed to get, you know, lined up to fix the issue, I can then unrevoke them. And let them back on the network. So we talked about um, the automated methods. I want to show you a little bit how that works. So um, first, let me just let me go back to the the workflow config um, and just just walk you through the admin side of that. So this is the workflow that we looked at all those examples for. And I just want to walk you through what the admin view looks like. So step one was the terms and conditions. We saw that. Step two is log in and register. So that was buttons that the user saw and they and they got to click whichever button they wanted to click on, right? So you can see there's two paths to go here and it showed the user as buttons. Then if we click login, the next thing we did was we prompted for the credentials. And then when we got those credentials, we got back from AD the list of group, mem group uh, list of groups that the user's a member of. And then the step four here is where we're classifying those users differently based off the group. And this, although step four looks just like step two, we didn't see buttons here because in this case, it wasn't a choice for the user. It was a choice that CloudPath made for the user based on their group membership. And just to show you, that's pretty easy to configure. I'll just show you what that looks like. All I had to do there is just, I used this group name pattern and I just matched students. So it's really that simple. Um, and you can see, by the way, there's a lot of other different types of filters and, and things you can do here. So I can match off usernames. I can match off device type stuff. 
location-based filters, um, lots of things I can do. But in most cases, all you really need to do is match them to a security group you already have, and you just go from there. So that's what I'm doing here, pretty easy. And then the uh, the next step was, you know, we had some choices. So like we could connect to the classroom network or do BYOD. Um, and I clicked on uh, classroom and then the, the final result was this result step. So in this case, I moved them to this thing called student and then I assigned a certificate with the certificate template. So the first piece here is called device configuration. And this is only used when you onboard through the, uh, the portal here. And then the second piece is the certificate template, which gets used for any certificate based authentication whether it comes to the portal or whether you use one of those MDM integrations we talked about. So let me show you how that's built. If I go into my managed templates, you can see I have a bunch of these templates here. And I have one for uh, for faculty and I have one for student, you know, different ones. Let's look at student. Well, the first thing you'll notice is if I edit this, you know, there's this basic kind of template name. So this is this is how we label the user in the controller. And then you see we have uh, a validity period. So in this case, I have it starting one month before issuance and expiring one year after issuance. Uh, the one year after part is probably obvious, but why why one month before? Uh, that's just because the clock might be set wrong on the device, and you know, with with crypto and inaccurate clocks, it can cause issues. So we, we don't we want to make sure that the, the device doesn't think it's living in a time before the start date. Um, so sometimes we pad that out. And that's why that's like that. Uh, then we have some radius policy stuff, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's kind of the main, uh, the first the first section here. Basically, you're just defining what, what it is and how long it's good for. I'm going to skip radius policy. I'll come back to it. We talked about notifications, but here's where you'd set them up. So if I wanted to send any of these notifications, I can set them up here. And you can see there's a couple of defaults. Um, and then we get into the, the interesting kind of integration piece. So for most of your MDMs, you're going to use these SCEP keys. Uh, this is pretty easy to set up. I, I click create SCEP key, and then, you know, essentially, it's just a, an API key for the MDM to talk to CloudPath. Um, and there's some settings around, you know, how you want to, to map, um, you know, what the expiration da date is, how you want to set this up, et cetera. We have guides for all this, it's pretty simple. But basically you just set up that API key integration. And then from that point on, the MDM can talk to CloudPath and pull certificates out of it for these users. This MSI package, this is for kind of, this is really more of a legacy thing, but you, you can use it. This is for Windows machines that are domain joined and you can push out uh, an MSI package via, you know, however you, however you deliver software to your Windows domain joined machines. Um, and then you would pair this with the group policy object that defined the uh, network parameters, like the, the wireless network name, the certificate to trust for the radius server, et cetera. Um, and then when the MSI package runs, it pulls the certificate for cloud, from CloudPath. These days, um, most folks, use Intune for that with the SCEP integration. So we don't see this one very often. And then the last one is the Chromebook, uh, the Chromebook one. And you can see here, you basically just need to turn this on. And again, it's pretty simple configuration. You just, you have an app ID and a Google API key. There's there's a, a JSON private key that, that comes from the Google admin that you have to like paste in here. So it's just a little bit of config you have to do on both sides, Google side and the CloudPath side, and then you get that integration built. Uh, and then the Chromebook console can pull these certificates right out of CloudPath. So that's um, pretty easy to get going. So that is, um, yeah, that's what a certificate template does for you. And then I, I mentioned we have this radius policy, which I skipped. So everything we've talked about so far, when we talk about policy and classification, it happens when you onboard the device. That's when we talk to the identity provider, we look at your group membership, and we classify you. But there's also a use case where you might want to do things differently at the time of authentication. So this is where I can do things like when you actually connect to the AP and we get the radius call, we can return attributes. Could be a dynamic VLAN, it could be other stuff. This is really easy to build. So in this, in this case, for my students, here's my radius policy. You can see it's just a single line. Um, the policy section where we have the conditions is actually blank. So this matches everything. And the attribute section, we're just returning this VLAN. And I feel like this is pretty simple to understand. And if anyone's ever used something like Aruba ClearPass or Cisco ICE or any of these more complex kind of radius policy engines, you know, it can be a little difficult to manage. What I love about what we do here at CloudPath is each certificate template has its own policy chain. So when I talk to customers, typically what they want to do is, is, is fairly simple, 
Um, and so there's no need to get overly complex here, right? If I just want to put all my students on VLAN 737 in this case, then all you need is this very simple statement. But it could be more complex than this. Um, and, and the key is that it's per template, right? So my faculty template will have a different, uh, a different statement, a different VLAN. Um, my admin will be different. Now, what if I, what if I have multiple VLANs for students, right? Well, again, I could break that into different uh, certificate templates. If I want to do it like per grade, for example, I might have a, a different template per grade. Or maybe I have a case where I have like different buildings. Maybe my students, maybe I'm a K through 12 uh, school district, and maybe my high school uses VLAN 10, and you know, middle school uses VLAN 11, and I have a couple, a couple elementary schools use VLAN 12 or 13, and I want this to work across everywhere. How do I do that, right? Well, you can do that too. You just you just need to create some more policy, and essentially, you just have one policy line for each school. So we can look at different attributes as the policy comes in. Usually, we use something like a NAS identifier or a NAS IP address, and that's going to tell you like where that uh, radius call came in from. So pretty easy to set up. As far as um, some of the other things that you have in Cloud Path, let me just uh, scroll through. I don't want to miss anything. We do also have this automatic VLAN configuration tool. So if you have um, if you have a use case where you want to put users on different VLANs and have each one get their own, you can you can map one of these VLAN pools to the uh, to the workflow as you set it up, and then each user will get a different VLAN. Now now where that's probably most used is in like dorm networks um, for for higher ed, and we actually built a whole other uh, system for that. And let me just actually gonna get into a different cloud path instance here where I have that built out a little more. And I'll show you what that looks like. So that's this managed access system. And the way this works is there, there's actually um, you know properties that you create inside of cloud path. So I can I create these things called properties, and then inside of property, I can create these things called units. And and this is like maps to all of my dorms essentially. And the way this works is when I create these. Each of my users gets their own tenant portal. So I'll get this link. Um, it could come in like a SMS message or an email when my dorm gets set up for me. And if I click on this link, in, in this case, it's like for a, a, a apartment managed Wi-Fi kind of use case, very similar for dorms. So I'll get a link. This link is just for me. So in this case, I'm in unit 99. And this gives me my, my Wi-Fi passphrase. So again, this is that dynamic pre-share key we talked about. So this one is Ruckus specific. But Here's my passphrase. So I can just type this into my devices. And as I do that, they'll show up here in my device list. So you can see I've already onboarded my iPhone. And here's another device. It's going to show up with a MAC address at first, but then I can come in here and rename that device if I would like to. So um, what this does for me is, first of all, if I ever need my key, you know, as long as I have this message that's got the link, I can go get my key. If I want to onboard devices, I just put that key into those devices still onboard. I can pull up that QR code like we saw before. I can scan this to get devices onboarded. And my devices will all show up here in this list. Now, with DPSK, I can assign device limits. By the way, I can do that for certificates as well. So if I want to say each of my users can have two devices, then you might see something like this. So this user has two devices onboarded. Uh, now, if I set the device limit for this key to two, this user is full now, right? So they can't, they can't onboard device number three. But by giving this custom portal to each of my users, now they can manage that on their own. So when this user decides they want to get a new phone, all they have to do is come in here and delete this phone from their portal. And that frees up a slot, and now they can onboard another device. And by the way, to do that, all they have to do is put that key in it. So this makes it like super easy and eliminates the overhead of having to manage these. What's really nice about this from, a, from like a dorm perspective is in the config here, we can map each of these units to a different VLAN. So you can see here, you know, unit 101, in this case, maps to VLAN 100. I don't know why I did that. It must have been a reason. <laughs> unit 102 maps to VLAN 102. At 103, maps to 103. So typically, I recommend doing this kind of one-to-one -one mapping, but you certainly don't have to. Um, and what happens here is each of these keys gets its own VLAN. So that means that any of these users, when they get onto their private network with this key, all their devices will be on the same VLAN. And they'll all be able to just seamlessly talk to each other. So if I want to like cast from my phone to an Apple TV or to a Chromecast or, or something like that, it's just going to work right away. And I'm not going to see all my neighbors' Apple TVs and Chromecasts. I'm not going to be able to connect to their devices. So it gives you kind of the personal network experience that is uh, it's kind of a differentiator. And it's really it's what people expect these days. 
um, you know, these so-called digital natives that, that grew up with iPhones. So it's really become more of an expectation. And we're seeing a lot of interest in this in, you know, both uh, student dorms as well as uh, apartment managed Wi-Fi. And just so you know, there's also the ability to create like management portals here. So you can create these management portals that give the front desk access, make it easy for them to change keys, et cetera. Um, what else you can do with that? A couple other things I'd like to point out about CloudPath. There is, um, well, we talked about policies. I didn't really show you how to build those policies, so I should probably just touch on that real quick. So to build those policies, um, it's it's two sections. There's a radius attribute group and a policy. The radius attribute group is going to be your uh, basically your settings that you return when the user authenticates. So in many cases, it's as simple as just a VLAN ID, right? If I need to map to a user role or something like that, I'll typically use this filter ID. So maybe I'll map that to a role called student. So that covers like 99% of what I see, but you can add whatever attributes you want. So you can, and these attributes, by the way, can, can be lots of different things. So they can be standards-based um, radius attributes uh, they can be ruckus specific attributes, or they may be a different vendor. So you can see we have some Aruba things in here, some Cisco things, some Fortinet things, et cetera. So essentially, we can support anything. If 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 you don't see the list here, it it, it means that you have to come over to the Radius server section and attributes and turn those on. So you can see that there are five thousand eight hundred ninety one. You probably can't see it, but take a word for it. Five thousand eight hundred ninety one um, attributes that are available, and then it you can hide or show these in the policy engine. So if, you, if you're using or you need to use some of these attributes, you don't see them, just come over here and click the show button and they'll show up for you. So that covers my attribute side. And then on my policy side, these are like the conditions that I'm checking when the user authenticates. So you saw where I could just leave this blank and we'll just go ahead and apply the attributes to anything that gets issued off that template. Or I can use things like NAS identifier. So this is how I'm going to typically match location. I might use NAS identifier or I might use radius client. Those two will, will typically match against uh, location. If I'm using dynamic pre-shared keys, I can match against the dynamic pre-shared key reference name. Uh, that's the name of the key. It lets me do interesting things like in my, in my property management um, example here, I added the keyword gold to my unit name. Now in CloudPath, when I, the unit name filters down to the key name. So this, word, this keyword gold will also appear in the DPSK name. And then I can match on that if I wanted to. So I could do something like uh, like this. So I could just match on, like this is a regular expression that says, if I see the word gold anywhere in the name, then I'm gonna match that. And then, so now what I can do is I can build different tiers of service. Like maybe I have like a silver, a bronze, silver, and gold tiers of service. And maybe maybe I upcharge for that higher level of service, you know, certain level access for free, but certain users maybe wanna pay more, get a higher level of experience. It, it lets me do those kinds of things. Uh, another thing I might want to do is put a time filter in. So in an educational use case, you know, maybe I have a guest network that I want to be available um, and have internet access during school hours, but, but maybe after school hours, I don't want that, right? So one thing I could do is put a schedule in the controller to, to turn off the SSID, or I could leave it up, but then just, you know, point it, point it to, to, to something else, right? Or maybe I have a limited access. Maybe I want limited access uh, during school hours and open it up later or vice versa. So any kind of different time-based behavior you can you can set up this way so that's available for you uh and then also in cloud path we have this uh we also have this uh not in this one um we have this tacx server so the tacx plus server and by the way this feature is not available in the cloud hosted version um, this is only in the on-prem virtual machine version and the reason for that is this this particular feature requires binding the cloud path server to a local Active Directory for authentication, uh, and that's why you only see it in the on-prem version. But this allows you to create uh, TACX profiles for managing access to your network devices, like switches and wireless controllers. Um, and, and that can even include things like command authentication, where maybe you have uh, a help desk, or sometimes in education, what we see is we have like student interns that sometimes help, and, and that can take load off of us, but we want to be very careful about how much access we give those kind of users. So this is a way that you can create uh, command lists that you can have like certain commands that that type of user can run, uh, let them help troubleshoot, but don't give them kind of too much access to where they can get themselves in trouble. So that can come in handy. And um, and that's really, I think covers most of what I wanted to walk through on CloudPath. So unless there's any questions, I think we can probably call it a wrap. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions that come up after the fact, uh, feel free to reach out, we'll get them answered. 
Absolutely. Thank you again, John. And again, thank you guys from the Ruckus team for coming on and helping out with this presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.